Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and I use cognitive science to ask questions about music. What that means is I try to understand how you do all of the amazing things you do when you're at a concert and you clap along. Um, so it's all about trying to figure out what gives rise to those kind of awesome abilities. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, very much not to a family of professional musicians. In fact, I think neither of my parents had ever had a music lesson in their life. They put me in piano in preschool so I would stop pestering them, and it stuck in a way that they did not expect or hope for, actually. Um, by the time I was in junior high, I was spending all my time outside school playing the piano, and by the time I was a senior in high school, I was so sure I wanted this to be my forever job that I enrolled at Music Conservatory at Peabody in Baltimore. So once I got there, I pretty quickly learned the rules of the game. They are practice six to eight hours a day, and that's number one. And number two is, above all, do not get on a bus and go down to Johns Hopkins and take a class. No. So within this very limited framework, I felt that it was super rebellious to climb aboard anyway and sneakily enroll in a class called Minds, Brains, and Computers. And it was actually already in the very first meeting of that class that it seemed completely obvious to me that you could use all these tools and methods from cognitive science and apply them to music and start to answer all of these questions that were bothering me um, as a pianist that I couldn't answer in the halls of a music conservatory. Questions like, but why? Like, you know, annoying questions, I'm sure. <laughs> like, but why does it sound a little better, right, if I play it louder here and a little softer here? Does it sound better to you if I play it that way? Would it have sounded better to someone 100 years ago or 100 years in the future? And most of all, how did music grip me so compellingly before I'd had any kind of training about it whatsoever, right? How did it uh, light that spark for me in the first place? So to give you some examples of the kinds of techniques we use to think about these issues, uh, we're going to bring out some fantastic young musicians. And you'll see they're wearing these sort of bands on their heads. And despite that they definitely deserve crowns for all of their hard work, it's not a sign of royalty. Um, it's just a little tool that's giving us a, a little window into their brain activity while they're performing. So please welcome Kelly Howard, the director of the Brooklyn Youth Music Project, and two musicians from the ensemble, Jeannie and Kiel. So we're going to see a visualization up on the screen. You're going to see outlines of two heads, OK? And what, those, we're, what you're really going to be looking at is the distance between the two heads. And what that represents is the degree of synchrony between their brains. So think about what brains are doing, right? And all the neurons that are firing, this is a pattern in time. And they can either be in sync with each other or not. So as these outlines get closer, um, it's showing that their brains, this, this activity is getting closer in sync. And as it comes apart, um, you can see that it's getting a little farther out of time with each other. Uh, okay, and so as you're watching this, there are two, you have two jobs. Your first job is to enjoy the music. And your second job is to think about the moments at which you see the heads coming together. What do you think might be happening in the music that's leading to that? Okay, so we're going to hear a, um, a gavotte by Rameau.
you, Jeannie and Kiel. So that's just a visualization, an example of the ways you can use these kinds of techniques to ask questions about what performers do and how music brings us together. Uh, I'll give you another example of the kind of work we do. So you can use a fuller EEG head cap, right, with lots of little electrodes. And I, we could actually put those on all of you if we had enough time and you didn't mind your hair getting sticky. Um, and you could all wear those while you listen to a musical performance up here, right? And um, at that point, we'd have all these complex readings come out, coming out of all of you. And we could just do something kind of simple with that. We could just crunch the numbers and identify the moments at which your brains were doing similar things. Right? Because while you're listening, you might be thinking about what you're going to eat for lunch, you might be thinking about a cool thing you're doing later today, and at those points, they won't be doing the same thing, right? So the moments when the brains are really, really stuck on something, it tends to be from the music here. So this allows us a little peek into the moments that are most engaging when people are listening to music, and then we can ask why those moments. So what really works in music and why? Uh, so I'd really like to thank uh, Suzanne Dicker of Dicker and Ostrich for the headsets we use, and also Emma Laurent and Phoebe Chen, who we saw out here <laughs> retrieving the headsets a moment or two ago from the NYU Department of Psychology. Okay, let's welcome two more extraordinary young musicians from the Brooklyn Youth Music Project. We have Sylvie on viola and Zach on cello. Another interesting question that we might ask about music is how similar listening to music might be to listening to speech, right? After all, they both are sequences of sounds that people can use to communicate. Uh, psychologist Diana Deutsch at the University of California at San Diego has discovered a really cool perceptual transformation that explores the boundary between those two domains. So let's take a listen to this here and see if we can get the transformation working for all of you. Um, the first thing that you're going to hear now is a brief clip of speech where I just asked a kid to talk about space. So let's hear what he has to say. It's just so amazing that we've managed to send a rocket to the moon. The moon, it's orbiting, it's super far away, it's a hostile environment. It's almost like humans aren't even supposed to go there, but we did. And it's just incredible. Okay, fair enough. Now we're going to go in and we're just going to take out a little clip of that, a little bit of what you heard, and we're going to repeat it a lot. Okay, don't worry, you, you just sit back. It's supposed to be repeating the insane number of times that you're about to hear it repeat. So just listen into this. The moon, it's orbiting. 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 You can tap along the moon, if you feel compelled. Okay. It's orbiting. The moon, it's orbiting. The moon, it's orbiting. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to go back and we're going to hear that first clip I played for you previously. And I promise you, it's the exact same sound file that we played before. Take a listen. It's just so amazing that we've managed to send a rocket to the moon. <gasps> Thank you. Our musicians for that. So we saw there how you could simply repeat something, right, and shift your perception of it. So something that initially sounded like speech could come to sound like song. And that opens up a whole world of interesting further questions we can use that transformation to answer. Like, what does it mean to listen to something musically? What does your brain do differently when it's listening to something as music? What, what does repetition have to do with this? And is it related to how repetitive a lot of music is? Or to the, fa and to the fact that we go back and listen again and again to our favorite songs? Uh, the, the really amazing thing about musicality, I think, is how widely it's shared among people. And it doesn't depend on having had years of formal training. It doesn't depend on having learned all kinds of fancy things about music theory. Um, you all know a ton of songs, right? So how many of you know Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? OK. So um, could I get some kids to come up from the audience here? And what's going to happen is they're going to sing us Twinkle, twinkle, little, but star is all on you, okay? So they're going to start us off with twinkle, twinkle, little, and you're going to continue to star. Can we get that? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. You're so good. Look at that. Okay. 
Fantastic. That was amazing. All right, now, we're going to make it just a little bit harder, OK? We're not going to use the words. So instead of twinkle, twinkle, little, we're just going to do that all on do, OK? Can we get that pitch one more time? OK, now on do. Do, 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 do. Again, amazing. OK, thank you so much to both of you. We're going to make it. <laughs> thank you. Now, let's try something a little crazier, OK? Now you've done it to a familiar song with words, and then we've taken away the words, and you can still do it. What if we give you a tune you have never heard before, OK? And we're going to try to get you to sing the next note. You can do it on do, OK? Jeannie is going to play us a tune you've probably never heard before. And when I'm going to cue you when she stops, and you all just come in with the next note on do. Got it? As loud as you can. Right? You've probably never heard that tune before. So you actually have to know a lot about music to be able to do that. And what's cool is that uh, you can absorb, as you're just moving around the world and hearing music, you track all kinds of statistics about what notes proceed to what following notes. And that's a really important um, underpinning for how you're able to enjoy music and, and be moved by it. Um, OK, so I'd like to conclude by just telling you why I think music cognition is the coolest job out there. I love that it combines uh, the arts and humanities and science, and that I get to play with a whole bunch of different people in different fields. And um, so if you're somebody who likes to deal with different ideas that people uh, frame in different ways and hang out with a lot of different types of people, a field like this that's really in the middle of a bunch of disciplines might be for you. Thank you so much for being such a great audience.